But about between 15 and uh, 25 years ago, when I was still worshiping the Roman tradition, I was asked to help organize a retreat for some Catholic high school youth. Um, and it was a wonderful thing to do to kind of get these kids you know, away from the normal elements that they're involved in to be involved in a place of faith. And one of the aspects of the retreat that was important was that a priest was going to come and hear confessions. And my job was to kind of make sure that everything was set up in the room and that the priest had everything that they needed. So he arrived and I asked him, do you have everything you need? He says, yes. And I said, you know, Father, We've got about a good 15 or 20 minutes before we're going to need you. Since you're already here, would you mind hearing my confession? To which he said, no, oh, no problem. So, went through the sacrament, bare one soul, as it were, and as we concluded, he says, do you know how much time I have left uh, before the kids come in? And I said, we've got a you know, solid five minutes. He's like, good, I need to get my hearing aids from <laughs> there were a lot of theological questions that followed in my mind after that that we can discuss on another day. But the idea of not being heard is one of the most painful feelings that a person can experience. When we don't think somebody is listening to what we're saying, it's not only an insult, but it's kind of a degradation. And so imagine then that when a person who is praying and bearing their soul to God, how it must feel if they believe that God is not listening or paying attention or just not interested in what they're talking about. That feeling can scar somebody spiritually for life. And I think there are many people that I have met who have fallen away from the church, who have fallen away from their life of faith because they said, God's not listening to me. God doesn't hear my prayers. That's why it's so wonderful that in today's Old Testament lesson, we have an excellent model for what it means that God hears and answers prayers. So today we have the story of Hannah. Hannah, we know, is the mother of Samuel, not that one, the one from the Bible. And of course, she is crestfallen. She is heartbroken. Because in her time period, and in the religious and cultural context in which she lived, burying a son is paramount for the tribe. Burying a son is paramount for the family. To this day, for many people, it still remains a painful aspect of life to be better or to not be able to bear children. So for, for Hannah, this is not the first time that she has spoken to God about this topic, I'm sure, because it's so prevalent and present right in front of her eyes because, of course, she has the other wife of Elkanah kind of yanking her chain and torturing her in that way. And so Hannah, in her desperation, goes before God, but her prayer this time is different. Because this time, the prayer that she has, that is a prayer of such desperation, is not bargaining with God, which is kind of what it can sound like if we're not careful. But it is a promise to God that she acknowledges that all this time, her prayer has been probably about her need and her desire. And so many of our prayers are really about our needs and our desires. But here, she is saying that this prayer for this child will be not just about her, but for all of Israel. It will be for whatever God deems that this child should be used for. And in this case, someone who will one day be a prophet. What I love about the story is that even before Hannah conceives and bears a child, she goes home content and at peace. Because when we begin to align ourselves, our hearts and our minds with the will of God, 
we get closer and closer to a life of peace. It's when we feel that our ideas and God's ideas don't sync up that we end up in a lot of spiritual turmoil. And so it's kind of with that in mind that I want to talk just a little bit about what does it look like when God answers prayers? Because God is listening. We worship and love a God who does hear our prayers. But it's just as important that we tune our hearts and listen carefully to God's answers. So what are the different answers that God can give? Well, God can say yes. Right? He does say yes. God can say no. God can say not yet. And perhaps most frustrating of all, God's answer can be silence. That's the most frustrating one of all is when you pray and you're like, okay, your turn. Say something. And God says, this needs to simmer for a while. I, I don't think you're ready to hear my answer. And it's that silence also that can be very difficult. Now Jesus in the Gospel today gives us a very important warning about people who will come in His name. Because when we pray to God, we pray through Jesus Christ. He is our only mediator and advocate. And Jesus, of course, says, Anyone who come, must, wants to come to the Father comes through me. And so when we pray, we need to make sure that we are indeed praying to Christ and not listening to answers that come from our own imagination or that come from people who say that they are the Messiah. When Jesus steps out of the temple and looks at the beautiful temple that's been under construction for a long time, he warns the disciples Eventually, not one stone will be laid upon another. All of this is going to be destroyed. And you know the disciples were scared because they normally like to ask Jesus publicly what he means. But this one was so scary, they talked to him privately and said, what do you mean by this? And before he goes into all the ideas of the birth pains and the earthquakes, the first thing he says is, be aware that there are going to be people who come and pretend to be me. And I kind of take this personally to say that there are times when I like to substitute my will for God's. That I say, this is what God is really telling me to do, and in actuality, I haven't listened. An extreme example of this is there was a preacher who is still preaching, he's one of the televangelist preachers you can see online. And I kid you not, his name is Creflo Dollar. I can't make that up. And he said, I have discerned, he said this is the proclamation, I have discerned that the Lord is telling me to ask you to help me purchase a jet. I think the closest that I could ever come to saying something like that would be, I have discerned that the Lord is asking me to ask you to donate your airline for us, so that I may fly commercial. But this person has substituted their answer for a prayer for God. It's clear in that aspect. But how guilty are we of doing some of the same things? How guilty are we of saying, Lord, I am praying to you for this, and by the way, this is the answer I want. So the sooner you get to that answer that I want, everything will be in harmony. We put shackles on God if we're not careful. And put Him in a very, very small box. In essence, I think if we're not careful, we treat God a lot like Google. We want to type something in and get a specific set of responses. And the one we like the most, we're just going to click on. That is not faith. Faith is what Hannah did. And faith is what Christ does in the Garden of Gethsemane when he says, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. 
Think like that takes courage. Because it pulls us out of ourselves and says that this is not in my hands. Now, you all probably already know this a little bit about me, but I'm a bit of a control freak. No, never, never, right? I never have to control the things around me. But when we do that, we don't allow other people, we don't allow God to be free. So the challenge I want us to look at this morning is the next time that we go and pray for something sincerely that we want, something that we are offering to God and saying, Lord, I desire this with all of my heart, is before we hit Amen on that prayer, that we say, but not my will, but your will be done. That's hard. And as I said, it takes faith and courage to be able to say that. But I do believe that here in our parish that we've exhibited that kind of faith and courage. If not, we never would have done so many of the things that we have done in our community to serve one another, to love one another, to evangelize out to the world. What is a pledge, just thinking about what we did last week, what is a pledge if not saying, in courage and faith, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. So the lesson that I learned was the next, every single time I've gone to a priest afterwards, I've always kind of snapped my fingers next to their ears to make sure that the hearing aids are in, which gets kind of really funny when it's a young priest. But always remember, please, that God does listen. But what he asks in return is that we be willing to listen as well.